Your class petty officer utilities man. E4. And it actually I made E5, but I didn't keep it. <laughs> we'll have to come back to that story later. Now, what general locations did you serve? Uh, for, with the Navy, I served in either just one of two places. I was either in Port Wyneme, California, which was the main CB base on the West Coast, better known as Port Who Knows Me, because the only people who knew where it was were CBs, and South Vietnam. And you said that you uh, completed a second term of enlistment with a different service. What would that be? U.S. Army Reserve. And what was the highest rank you attained while in the Master Army? Sergeant, uh, E-8. Now, Mr. Gamash, were you drafted or did you enlist into the CBs? I know, it's kind of a loaded... I act, no, no, there's there's a story behind that, if you got the time for it. I uh, yeah. I initially wanted to go into the Marine Corps, but my father would not sign the paperwork because both he and my brother and his father had all been in the Navy, and I was going to continue the family tradition of being in the Navy. And after that, I got into the plumber's local in Hartford, Connecticut, and... Now I'm seeing a bit of a future for myself, so now the military is no longer our top priority, and now I'm more interested in pursuing my career as a plumber. And sure enough, because I was only a high school graduate, it was only a matter of time before my draft notice was I mean, I was going to get drafted. And when I did get my notice, I made up my mind that it, uh, I was going to enlist. At least I could go into the branch of my choice. You know, if I if I got drafted, I could end up anywhere. You know, so I chose to go to the New Britain Post Office. I enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and uh, I dare say a live omission is still alive. My recruiter <clears throat> forgot to mention that when I told him that I wanted the U.S. Navy Seabees, that. Like 99 out of 100 CBs were all going to Vietnam. He failed to mention that to me. So, but Now, where were you living at the time that you enlisted? I was living at home. That would be in Bristol? Yep. Okay. And do you recall the date that you enlisted in the Navy? I started, my actual enlistment started on, I don't know the exact day, but I know it was February of 1967. Good time to be at the Great Lakes. Now, uh, how were you assigned to the CBs, or how did you elect to join the CBs as a particular military occupational specialty? Well, back then when I enlisted, you know, the recruiter told me he could guarantee me what they called A school for the CBs, which is your entry level schooling that you do in the Army, it's AIT and Navy, call it A school. And, uh, but he did tell me one thing that was factual, that if I failed that school, then the Navy could basically put me wherever they needed me most, okay? And I, you know, I told him, you, you just get me into the school, I'll take care of the rest, you know what I mean? And, uh, because for me, going to the A school for utilities men was not really all that difficult because I already had a lot of prior experience at, at pipe fitting and things like that, so it wasn't all that difficult, really. Uh now, what would a typical day of training be like at A school? A school? Well, you get up first thing in the morning, you go out and you do a little PT, obviously. First thing you do is a little PT. I say little because in, in, I dare say in uh, the Navy, PT is nothing like it is in the Army or the Marine Corps. It's not even close. But you do a little PT, and then it's all classroom after that. Like, But the difference in A school, like when I say classroom, it's not – like civilian classroom. There's a lot of hands-on training, okay? They, you don't just learn out of the book. You know, you learn out of the book first, but before that particular block of instruction is over, you have the tools in your hand and you're you're actually doing the job. That's how the, that's how the military teaches, all the military teaches their people how to do their jobs. There's a lot of hands-on training. Now, There's no better training in the world than hands-on, I can tell you that. Now, was your A school at Fort Wayne? Yes. Okay. And if we can go back a little bit to the Naval Training Center at Great Lakes. Right. Uh, what was your first day like there? 
A little intimidating, I would say. Well, that would be the first word that I would use. Cold would be another, okay? I thought the winners in New England were something to behold, but they're, they're nothing compared to the Great Lakes effect that we were getting out there. When it snowed out there, you could actually see it building up on the ground. Around here, you don't know it until you get up in the morning, you know, but out there you could tell. And it was, uh, I lost, trying to think, I went in at 198 pounds. It was pretty hefty when I went in. I came out of basic training 163 pounds. And it was not from PT. It was from surviving on cornflakes and fruit for 11 weeks. I just I couldn't get used to the food. You know? The chicken and get up and walk off the plate. I and mean, they tried to force feed you liver every chance they got. I'm not a real big, I'm still not a big fan of liver. So. But that was the biggest reason why I think I lost so much weight. I just couldn't handle the food. So was it a lot of physical exercise? Was there any classroom activity? A lot of both. Uh, in the Navy, they, they emphasize not tying, firefighting. A lot of, uh, which in my case, didn't really apply so much because a lot of the training you got was based on you being part of the naval service aboard ship. You know, and in three and a half years in the Seabees, I spent a half an hour on a ship. That was by design because I didn't want to be aboard ship. Um, but, you know, you do the firefighting, you do all the training for pipe fitting on board ship and all of that, okay? That's just a basic training now. And uh, drilling ceremony, military customs, identifying rank, you know what I mean? Just it's your basic level stuff you got to learn. You know, first thing you want to do is you want to definitely learn how to identify rank because the last thing you want to be doing is demoting officers or promoting enlisted people. That'll get you in trouble every time. So, I just saluted everybody that had a uniform on. That would have covered my butt. <laughs> and I mean everybody. Postal postal workers, trash trash pickup guys. I saluted everybody. Cover all your bases. That's exactly correct. So now uh, on to Port Wainey. Uh How many weeks, how many months? Was uh, well, I got there... Well, let's see. I probably got there just at the beginning of the summer of 67. We started A school right away. And I was I was there all the way through the end of 67. And didn't really, didn't, didn't know if I was going. I knew I was going to Vietnam, but I didn't know when or even with whom. Because I was actually part of an MCB at first. And, but then what they did, they decided, I guess they needed some maintenance units in Vietnam, so they, they pulled people out of MCBs and formed these two units. Now, for the sake of the interview, uh, could you explain that acronym, MCB? MCB is a mobile construction battalion. You know, it's, that's, that's, your, that's your main unit formation in the CBs is MCBs, okay? You might have derivatives of that, but that's the main that's the main force is the MCBs. So uh, tell me about some of your boot camp and training experiences. Do you recall any of your instructors? Oh, boy. Well boot camp I, I don't know if I should tell you the story about our boy Gaston. Yeah maybe I will. And Gaston was the guy who thought he would be funny and rolling orange down the middle of the formation one day, just in time for our company commander in the Navy, the drill sergeant is called a company commander. Noticed the orange rolling through the middle of the formation, which for obvious reason didn't please him a, bit, a whole lot. Uh, next thing you know, we're doing rifle drills and extra PT and our boy Gaston is not owning up to it. So you know, we did a few things. We, we started off with the menthol shaving cream around the armpits and the groin, you know what I mean, to see if that would wake them up a little. That didn't work. We tried a blanket party. That didn't work. And uh, because we were doing this PT every day, you know, because nobody was owning up. So finally, you know, we just got to do something. So one of the guys from Mansoni got, got the bright idea of tying his big toes. He slept in the top rack. Tying his big toes to the bed frame with his bootlaces and waiting for Reveille. Well, 
when he Revely came out, he went to go jump onto the ground, and everything left the bunk but his big toes. He was hanging from the bed frame by his big toes. He he went into the office and owned up after that because we told him it only gets worse, pal. So you know, sooner or later. Now, as uh, as CBs, you probably you know, they might expect you to uh, see combat. Did you get weapons training and like that? Before we went to Vietnam, we had uh, what they referred to as military training. Um, I dare say it was. As a drill sergeant, uh, when I was a drill sergeant, we would call the same kind of training nighttime and daytime defensive fire training, which is how to man a perimeter. Okay. okay. In the CBs, you never went looking for anybody. So, you know, you're, you're, most of your combat action would be manning a, manning a perimeter. And that, that was the focus of the training, you know, how familiarization with the weapons. Uh, I should say that uh, they changed the weapon on us kind of midstream, too, because initially we were training with an M14, all right, and they switched us over to an M60. And if I had my drillers, I'll take the 14 any day of the week. But because they went and changed the weapons just prior to us getting ready to deploy, there wasn't a lot of familiarization time, okay? And when it came time to qualify with the weapon, Yours truly, all I kept seeing was Maggie's drawers, the red beanie that goes back and forth telling you, you missed everything. And I wasn't even hitting the frame, forget the target, okay? And uh, what really gets me is when the scores came out, they had me down there as being a sharpshooter. Bottom line was, if you could squeeze the trigger, you were getting on the bird and you were going, that was it. They weren't too interested in whether or not you could actually hit what you were shooting at. No. So, uh, how did you get... That's a wartime it? thing. Peacetime, it might be a little different. <laughs> now, how did you get through it? Uh, was it, you know, uh, like mentally, physically? Basic training? Yeah. Basic training for me, to tell you the truth... Because I had a father who was very much a disciplinarian. You know, you shined your own shoes, you made your own bed, you did the dishes, you did the housework, you did the yard work, you know what I mean? My father used to say the greatest thing ever happened to him was having two sons, because he never did a thing. He never mowed a blade of grass, never shoveled a flake of snow, okay? And that aspect of it, I dare say, when I got to basic training, for me, wasn't that big a deal, you know? Now... In the Navy, they, it's more a physical, uh, a mental game than it is physical. Okay, they'll tell you they got you got to fold your clothes exactly one foot, exactly one foot. Everybody has a ruler and they measure their clothes, and it has to be one foot because the guy who inspects has a ruler. So if you think you're going to blow it by him, that's not going to happen. Okay, my first inspection, I really stepped in it pretty bad because I. I was the first person he inspected, and when he looked at it, I passed. Then he goes to the next bunk, next bunk, next bunk. I know what I've done wrong, but he's not catching it yet. He's like three bunks down, and then he stops, and I said, oh, boy. Sure enough, and he looked back at me, and he's looking at that locker. He comes back, looks at my locker. What I had done in your wall locker, all your darks are supposed to be on one side and all your lights or whites are supposed to be on the other. I had him 180 out, but it took him about four punks to figure out. He knew something was wrong with it, but he couldn't quite get it right away. As soon as he did, boy, I mean, took care of that. I was doing a lot of extra PT for a few days. So how about, um, was the testing, did it come in the form of written tests, or would it be exercises, hands-on? In basic training, a lot of it was written. There was there was there was some uh, practical testing too. A lot of it was written. I want to say, okay. Now, when you went to A school, that was completely different. That was all hands on. Okay, they gave you a corner room. Told you they wanted you to do all the rough plumbing. Told you, you know, gave you a print, gave you all the material you needed to do it with. You know, and your job was to go in there and just you know pipe it up. You know, so. But uh, that that was that was easier for me because, like I said, I had some some prior experience at it. You know, there were certain things. I, I I would say though, A school was probably the most comprehensive school that I've ever been to. 
I say that because for the rate of utilitiesmen, you had to be proficient in the following. Plumbing, heating, boilers, refrigeration, air conditioning, water treatment, sewage treatment, and water purification. That all fell under your rate. Now, if I, let's say I hadn't gone into CVs and I stayed home. Back then, in those days, journeymen would not teach you anything. It was a mindset. They were afraid the apprentices were all going to take their jobs away from them. So it was like, cut it that long, kid. Cut it this long, kid. Why? Don't ask stupid questions. Just cut it. Okay. You didn't really, you know, it was, it was up to you to learn the trade. Okay. Whereas in the CBs, especially in Vietnam with the whole D Rose thing, okay, you not only learned your own trade, but because of out of just plain necessity, you had to learn other trades. Okay. Case in point, when I went to Vietnam, I couldn't drive a standard car. Could, could not drive a standard car. Took a driver's test when I got to Vietnam, passed the test, with the exception of the depth perception part of the test. This is what I had never taken one of those before. It's like 21 rows of seven circles, and one circle in each row is either closer to or farther away from you than the other six. And you have to identify that one circle. I think I got like two out of 21 rows correct. Obviously a problem there. But the best part was when I had to do the practical test, he takes me outside and puts me in front of a five-pound dump truck and tells me to take it up the hill. This thing has 10 speeds, forward, seven in reverse, high and low range. I thought I was sitting in a cockpit. I just started laughing at the guy. He says, what's so funny? As you don't understand, pal. P, N, D, R, and L, and no clutch. This is what I'm familiar with. He hands me the keys to an old beat-up Jeep tells me that they don't have automatics in Vietnam. So I, he suggested I learn how to uh, drive a standard right away. So after finishing A school, how long did it take you to go to Vietnam? Well, actually, A school, I want to say I was done by, that was about 12 weeks. So probably I want to say At the latest August or September, I was probably done with A school. And for the next, I want to say August, yes, yeah, so September, I told November. Yeah, I sat around for a good four months before I actually shipped out. You know? And there was, there was, the worst part was there were a couple of times when we were told that we were shipping. And then at the last minute, they told us we weren't going. And I'm telling my girlfriend at the time, I'm getting ready to go. Then I'm telling her I'm not going. So when I finally did go, she she was a little reluctant to believe me. I said, well, you better believe me because this time I'm actually going on. I'm actually, I'm now, on my way. Did your graduating class go over as individuals? Did you just end, like, you know, were you? I did not, no, country? no. Or were they just so, like, you know, it could just be, you know, you're a lucky number and you sent down. Well, you know, it, like I say, with the that D row situation where people get sent home, okay, they need to be replaced. So it was a one on one basis. If an equipment operator D roast out, they'd reach out and grab an EO from Port Wyneme and send them over. Same thing with a UT or whatever. It's like I said earlier to you, uh, when I flew over to Vietnam and when I flew back, I didn't know a single person on the plane either way. So yeah. when you first arrived in country, where did you land? Cameron Bay. And what was your first impression upon arrival? First two things okay. would be the heat, obviously. I don't think one can really prepare for that. And believe it or not, the next thing that really caught my attention was the stink. The whole place smelled like food garbage. You know? that, 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 uh, that'll rock your socks a little bit when you, you know. How long did you stay in Cameron Bay? I was there for about two weeks. I actually thought I was going to stay there for my whole tour. <clears throat> what they'll do is a that was our home base, CBMU 302, that was our home base, Cameron Bay. And I thought that's where I was going to stay for my whole tour. And on the, we had softball fields, basketball courts, round-eyed women, cold beer, hot meals, showers, porcelain toilets, you know. I'm looking around going, man, I could handle this for a year. I, this, this is beautiful. I even sent my father a, a picture from, uh, the one picture I sent my dad from Vietnam. I'm standing on a beach at Cameron Bay with goggles, a snorkel, fins, and this big shell I had taken off the bottom. You know, now, the beach at Cameron Bay was, 
it was absolutely pristine. It was one of the most beautiful beaches you'd ever want to see. And it was excellent for snorkeling, okay, because there wasn't a lot of waves and all of that. The water was very clear. And I'm saying, yeah, I'm looking around going, boy, yeah, I could definitely do this for a year. This is not a problem. I mean, during the day now, you got a job to do, but four o'clock runs around, the rest of the time is yours, okay? Well, it, the bottom line was you spent the first two weeks at Cameron Bay to get you acclimated to the heat, the humidity, okay? Carrying a load, all right, and working under those conditions, all right? But when your two weeks were up, pack your trash because you're going here or you're going there, you know what I mean? So, so from, uh, so what was your basic duty assignment in Cameron Bay? Cameron Bay was what we were doing there, believe it or not, was working on the, uh, the, the rather large septic tank they had set up there. It got all clogged up, and uh, I won't go into how we unclog big septic tanks, but suffice to say, it's not a fun job, you know? You're doing a lot of washing of the hands afterwards. So, from Cameron Bay, where did you go? Went right to uh, where I spent most of my time in Vietnam. A place called Don Tam. D O N G, capital T A M. Okay. That and uh, Mito are the two places. Mito is capital M Y, capital T H O. Their Mito is right along the Mekong River. Dong Tam was the main base for the 9th Infantry Division. Okay, we had a detachment down there. We were right alongside of the main base for the 9th Infantry. Is that three corps? Four corps. Four corps. Mekong Delta. And so, what did you do in Dong Tam? Well, first off, I should tell you my, my first night there was. Uh, as we came in on the plane, the first thing that happened was they sh Bay. No, no, we, f we flew in on a caribou from Cameron Bay to Dongtam. A caribou is like a little mini C-130 is what it is, really. And uh, on the way in, without warnings ahead of time, they shut off all the engines to the plane. So you had a detachment of CBs that were, to say the least, a little nervous in uh, it was a little game they were playing on the CBs. You know what I mean, it was just, you know, they could have told us ahead of time if they wanted to, but they you know, why, why do that when they could have a little fun with us? So we were you know, we were getting a little nervous, and the guy says, don't worry about it, man. We glide in for stealth purposes, you know, and we look at them like, you know, thanks for telling us that ahead of time, you know what I mean? But when you looked out the craft, you could see this little, what looked like a postage stamp in the middle of the jungle, and we could see... The flares going off all around the perimeter. You could see caps going off all around the perimeter. And I think to a man, we're all sitting there looking around and, that, you know, it sounds funny, but I swear that this is your, your mindset. You're saying to yourself, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. You know what I mean? Because ju you just went from, you know, a relatively safe place to this in an hour and a half, okay? I got to digress a little bit. You asked me about my, uh, when I initially got off the plane in Cameron Bay. Right. My experience is similar to uh, John's a little bit in that you're getting off the plane. You got, you look like palm model of soap. Your greens are brand new. They're bright green. Everything's all shined up, right? And here's this unit of guys, okay? You get off, they're getting on. They've already been there. Their greens are all faded and torn, right? And they look pretty ragged, okay? So we get into a formation on the tarmac. And this one guy, now why he chose me, I couldn't tell you. He walked up to me in a formation. He looks me right in the eye. True story tells me. says one thing to me. He goes, death is the ultimate alarm clock. And he turns around and walks away. You know, I look at the, you know, did anybody understand? No, absolutely not. Had no idea what the hell he was talking about. You know, I know he scared the living hell out of me, I can tell you that. Because he had that look, you know, like, you know, I, that, you know, I didn't know what that was all about. He got my attention, I know that. But I should say that after the first night, okay, I, uh, I'm going to take it through the first night. Is that all right? Absolutely. 
I'm on a cot. Everybody else is on a bed. I'm on a cot. I, I, I'm the highest ranking UT there. So I told the guys, I'm an E3 and the highest ranking. It was only because I was an E3 and longer than the other guys were. Okay. But I told them to go ahead, take the beds. I would take the cot. I know sooner or later I'd get a bed or whatever. So I'm laying on a cot and you could hear way off in the distance. Okay. You could hear all the racket going on, you know, but it was way off in the distance from where we were. But you're laying there, you're having a conversation. I think that every person who's ever went into a war zone has had that little conversation you have with your maker where you tell them, you know, you'll be a priest if you just get me out of here with everything intact, okay? Nobody's going to tell me they didn't have that conversation because I know they all did. I'm, and I'm having that conversation when I hear what up to that particular point in time in my life was the largest explosion I had ever heard. Had no idea what it was, okay? And I got up, and I'm running to the bunker at the end of the hooch. And I swear, Bob Hayes couldn't have caught me. I was, that, that was the most scared I had ever been in my lifetime. My eyes, my eyes probably could have lit up a trail at midnight. I mean, I was wide-eyed and scared out of my wits. And I'm running to the bunker, and there's a guy in the bunk, the last bunk before you leave the hooch. He rolls over and says, outgoing, new guy. And I looked down, oh, okay. And I feel a little stupid. I turn around and walk back to my rack. And as I'm walking back to my rack, he tells me that, don't worry about it, there's sport. Says, Before this night is over with, you'll know the difference, okay? And I dare say he was absolutely correct. Because we didn't take a lot of large incoming artillery rounds, primarily mortars, small arms fire, the truth of the matter was the big booms were ours because I found out later on there was a 155 howitzer battery about maybe 100 yards out behind our hooch. Okay, It made my whole cot bounce on the floor. All four legs were rattling on the floor when it went off. And the little booms were theirs. And it was, it's just as simple as that. But before the night was over, he wasn't lying because I, I fully understood. But getting back to... The death is the al ultimate alarm clock thing. Um, that night, too, this is also where I learned not to volunteer for anything. You always tell you that, all right? Sure enough, you know, Dumbo here. Ninth Infantry comes into our hooch and wants to know if anybody there can handle an M60 machine gun. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Good, come with me. Uh, next thing I know, I'm in, I'm in a bunker with two guys from the Ninth Infantry Division on the wire trying to repel an attempt to overrun our position. This is this is the Tet Offensive now in 68. And first thing they do is a little run a little game on a CB, tell us they're going to take a nap to keep an eye on things. You know, I looked, that, that didn't work for me. I, first off, I don't know proper radio procedure. I, mean, I haven't been taught that one. Don't know how to talk to anybody. And I don't know how to defend a perimeter all by myself. Are you guys crazy or what? No. But we went through truth. I mean, they were up in the, they were they were in the holes very soon afterwards. As soon as the round started coming in again, we we you know. But we went through four boxes of ammunition. There's about two thousand rounds per box. I think I think it's two thousand rounds. Four. We went through four boxes of ammo. When we changed barrels at least at least twice, three times. Okay. Now, what you're doing in reality is you're not aiming at anything. You know, you have sector stakes, and you're just firing your weapon at utilizing what's called grazing fire. And I learned this lesson over there, too, which is fire that you keep anywhere from two to three feet off the ground. All right, you're aiming for the middle of the torso is what you're doing, really. And you're taking your weapon, you're going from your right sector stake to your left, your left to your right, right to left. And your sector stake, what it does, it overlaps the position next to you. That's what they call the interlocking fields of fire. So everything overlaps and so there's no holes in your perimeter, okay? And all you're really doing is throwing a lot of lead out at the wire. That's all you're really doing all night long, okay? And you don't know what's happening. You're just throwing out a lot of lead. First light, I dare say... Uh, up to that point in my life, I never realized what the destructive power of weaponry was like until I saw what our camp looked like the next morning. 
there were two or three hooches that were no longer there, okay? I won't get into what I saw in the wire, but what I saw in the wire was an eye-opener to say the least, and, uh, <clears throat> but right then and there, at that particular moment, I got to tell you, that's, so when the guy told me death is the ultimate alarm clock, I'm saying to myself, you know what? I understand it, because up until that point in time, okay, I had been asleep, or at least I hadn't been fully awake, okay, because at that particular moment, that's when I'm saying to myself, that's when it occurred to me that I could actually die here, okay. I want to say up until that point in time, I mean, it was, you, you thought about it, but it wasn't, it still didn't hit you as a reality, if you know what I'm saying, okay, until that particular moment. Then I knew, I said, man, you know what? You get out of this place, man, you better consider yourself one lucky dude because. Did you see any of the assaulters at night when you were uh, operating the machine gun? Did I what? Did you see any of the assaulters, any of the? We, you see shadows, you know, you don't, you don't see, you know, I'm glad you, I, I'm actually glad you asked me that question because every year we do this thing, when I'm going to, speed ahead a little bit. We do this thing on the Memorial Boulevard in Bristol where the high school students tour all the monuments on our boulevard, right? And every year I, I'm the I'm the guy who does the Vietnam Memorial. And every year I get asked the question if I killed anybody while I was in war. You know, it's an, it's inevitable. And the teachers get upset at them asking a the question, but I surprise them even more by telling them that I want to answer the question. Okay. And I and my answer is a standard one. My answer is is that I don't know. Did I try? Yeah, absolutely. Did someone try to take my life? Absolutely. Okay. But I thank God every day that I I don't have the baggage of the faces of people whose lives I took from them. I don't have to carry that baggage around. And I thank God for that every day. Because I don't I don't know if I'm a strong enough person to be able to cope with that, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know. I mean, that to me is that's some tough baggage to carry around. You know, so you know, that's what I tell them. I don't know. So the anonymity helps. It does. Absolutely helps. And um, did you see combat um, on outside the wire? No. We 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 were a non-combat unit. We never went looking for the enemy, if you will, okay? But being in a fixed position like we were more often than not, we weren't exactly all that hard to find, if you know what I'm saying. So were you well integrated with the Army? Oh, yeah. We augmented the 9th Infantry Division. We worked with their combat engineers. We uh, augmented. Sometimes we went up north. We augmented the Marine Corps. If they took some took some ground, we would uh, build some outdoor showers for them, an outdoor latrine, or you know what I mean, or a six holer. Okay, you know what I mean by a six holer. Yes. Oh, yeah. well, you know what that term is. Yeah, take the fifty-five gallon drum. You cut them in half, three of them, and put some pipe. No, you just build a little seat over the top of them. Right? And the guys that mess up, they get to burn the poop. You just call it shit burning detail. Boy, Michael, I never had to do that. That was a nasty, never had to do it, man. I got to tell you, I'm glad I didn't have to do it. I think it was gasoline, jet fuel, and something else that they poured in there. Lit it a flame, you had to stir it to make sure that it all burned. I mean, those are just some guys that screwed up that got that detail. I never, I never got that far along, thank God. So how universal was kind of the operating procedures, the equipment between the Marine Corps, the Army, and the Navy? Uh, it seems like you had experience working with uh, those branches. Like, could you... I want to say between us and the combat engineers, there was a lot of similarity in the equipment that we used. You know, it depends on the unit's mission, obviously, okay? I mean, infantry units, nothing like they have, Okay. But combat engineers and us, we had, there's a lot of similarity. We, we, you had to have a good working relationship with them because one of your pieces of equipment will go down. You know, you'd have to go to them and ask them if you could use the one they had, you know, and vice versa. Okay. Just to give you a story about that, too, we had a new supply guy, a new motor pool guy. You know, the old guy de out and they got a replacement for him. Okay. Now, the old guy, I had a really good working relationship with him. The new guy, I went over there asking him uh, if we could use his trencher, and uh, he gave me some song and dance about how it was down, and I'm looking in the up section of his motor pool, and I could see it sitting right there. So I know he's stroking me. I said, no problem. You know, I go back about midnight to get in my Jeep, and I find out which beer cooler is his, 
And I take out my tri gauge and I took all the Freon out of his beer cooler for him. Next morning, about 07, I get a phone call from this here wanting to know if uh, I could put the Freon back in his beer cooler. I said, Yeah, when I see the trencher, you get the Freon. Does that work? He goes, Yeah. And I took him a little, I had to hit him over the head a little bit, but he figured it out eventually. So, um, in terms of defensive operations, would you take turns rotating uh, in bunkers, you know, on the line at night? Uh, no, you had one position that you went to every night. And I, you weren't on the, you weren't on the wire every night. Okay. The only time we actually found the CBs now. Okay. Now the army were there every night. Okay. The only time the CBs actually manned the wire is when there was an attempt to overrun. How often did that happen? Uh, oh boy. Wow. Well, times did it happen? Would it be weekly, monthly? I, I want, no, I want to say maybe once every two months or so. It happened. It had to happen about nine or 10 times while I was there. So it was pretty intense, you know. But that's the only time we were in the perimeters when there was uh, a real attempt by. Now you have to understand in the Delta, you did you didn't see the North Vietnamese Army, the regulars. What you saw were Viet Cong and sappers. You didn't see uniformed personnel per se. Okay, so it was usually was it local force or main force? Local force. Yeah, local force. It was, when you say main force, now, I don't know that the Viet Cong had what I would refer to as main forces or, you know, large units. Okay. They may have. I, I don't know, to be perfectly honest with you. I know the NBA did. The NBA had divisions of battalions and companies and platoons. Okay. But I don't, I'm not so sure if Charlie actually had that. You know, they had a large, they had large numbers. Okay. They had, they certainly had sufficient numbers to cause a little hell on our wire, let's put it that way. Did they ever breach the perimeter? No. Were there they weren't going to get through. Gee, there was no way. Between the Claymores, you know, I shouldn't say this on air, but you know what I mean, because we weren't supposed to use them, but we used bungee pitch. I know I know the 9th Infantry put some bungee, pit, uh, some bungee pits, pungee sticks, pits, out on a wire, Okay. The way we looked at it, you know, they they can use them on us. Why the hell can't we use it on them? Yeah. That's couldn't tell anybody you were doing that though. Did you ever have to call in close air support? Would you ever see? We had we in the way of air support. Um, we had Cobras. We had Huey gunships, and we had the Navy Sea Wolves, which were the Navy's version of a Huey gunship. Same thing. Right. Every night, uh, we would take mortar. We would take mortars just about every night, and you could almost set your watch by them. And it would vary. What they would do is they would start dropping rounds on the Navy side, and they would work their way over to the Army side where the Ninth was, and then they would call it quits for the night. It was always the same; it never changed. So as soon as they started hitting the Army side. We'd come out of the bunker and go up into, we had a little screened in porch above, above the bunker, take out a few beers and watch them pound on living hell out of Army side all night long. But, was it accurate fire or were they just harassing you? I, well, that's, you know, that's a good question because there was one night they had to have, had to have paced them off. We had three very large almost, almost Chalmer, Chalmer, almost Chalmer generators. Huge ones. They powered the whole base. Okay. Dropped three rounds, one each. So they knew where they were dropping those rounds. I mean, they, you know, I mean, there was no walking up to them or anything. Like usually, you know, they'll walk them up until they, you know, and then you'll, then you'll get the command fire for effect once you know you're on target. Okay. They just dropped three rounds in and they hit all three generators. So somebody, one of our local indigenous personnel who were coming in and out of our gate every day, had to have had to have paced these things off. So. What did you think of the Arvin? We didn't get to deal with them very much. Thank God for that, because I didn't. The stories I heard about them, you know, if the action was over here, they wanted to go over there. So, but I should tell you, this there is a story attached to when they took out all three generators. The whole base went dark, with the exception of the CB hooch, because we had our own generator. Now, CO came around. Now, he had already been there once before. Another story I want to tell you about the bunker we were in. 
he took one look at me and he goes, CB bunker, right? And he goes, yes, sir. Says, How is it? I'm the commanding officer of this post and I'm in the dark and you guys have fans, lights, tape techs. I said, sir, would you like us to get you a generator? He goes, yeah, I would very much want you to get me a generator. So we had we had a finagle a deal to get him a generator. How was he? I mean, he was right. He was the commanding officer of the post. He's in the dark. Yeah. But the, you should see. The, I got to tell you the one about the bunker, though, because our bunker was big enough for sixteen racks, single, not doubles, sixteen single racks. The walls of that bunker, I want to say, were at least eight foot thick all the way around. Airstrip matting. Okay, you could drop, I think you could drop a pretty good hefty bomb in this thing. You weren't going to move this baby, okay? I mean, we're in the CBs. We had access to the, to the material, so, you know, we built a bunker, okay? We had refrigerators. We had fans, lights, tape decks, okay? Well, we didn't know, but the uh, commanding officers coming around doing a spot inspection of all the, all the bunkers to see if they were up to speed. Now, being I'm in the last rank or the rack that's closest to the door, when he comes in, it's my responsibility to yell out attention on deck so that everybody there knows the CO has just entered the bunker. And he looked at me because I had, he had never met me before. I never met him either. And he wanted to know if this whose bunker this was. I says, this this the CB bunker, sir. And he goes, Really? He looks at me and goes, Petty Officer, first thing tomorrow morning, first light, you will put together a detail and build me, the commanding officer of this post, a bunker that looks just like this one right here. Can do, sir. Now, when we went to see his bunker, we could see why he was so upset because his bunker was like eight by eight by six. Had one table, one little light bulb hanging down, one chair, and one cot. And with a radio on the table. And that was his bunker. This is the commanding officer of the whole post. Now, when he saw ours, he must have flipped out. And said, no, no. There's no way I'm the CO and I get a bunker that looks like this when these guys are over there listening to tape decks and everything else. So we built them a bunker. Were there any casualties in your unit while you were overseas? Yeah, we had a couple. We had one guy that uh, his uh, shovel. He got into the sand and uh, don't know why the, the door on the other side of his cab he, could, he couldn't open it up. He hit the sand and the whole thing tipped over and landed right on top of him. He couldn't get out of the cab. So he was uh, he was a Filipino guy. He was the guy who used to fall asleep with his eyes open every night. A guy by the name of Cab Coogan. He uh, yep. Yeah. He just didn't, he didn't make it up. And we had one guy that got hit. Cabagoo could have something to do with this, too, because he kept, he wouldn't hit the bunker at the same time as everybody else. He'd always wait a little bit, try to buy a couple extra minutes of sleep so somebody would go in and go get him. Uh, one guy went in to go get him and, uh, the round hit, I mean, it had to hit in just the right place because, I mean, the bunker be between the back door of the hooch and the opening to the bunker could have been more than, shit, three feet, four feet maximum. Because the rule was when you opened up the door of the hooch, because the bunker was half in the ground, half above the ground, you couldn't just, you didn't just run standing straight up. You had to dive into it, okay, and do it like a combat roll and stand up when you got inside. The round hit between the bunker and the hooch as he was going in to try and get Cabby Coogan out of there. That's when we told Cabby that uh, nobody's coming to get you anymore, pal. You don't get up when we yell out mortars, you're on your own sport because nobody else is going to get hurt going in to get you. Forget it. You know, and I don't think it was coincidence that he managed to get up every time after that when, we, when, when somebody yelled out mortars to get up. Besides that, did it have any other effect on him? On Cabacuga? Uh, 
it it seemed pointless to to for us to harass him more about it because I think, you know, I, I think he that's why I think he he got up after that because he knew that you know somebody had gotten hurt because it because of the game he was running, and uh, we didn't we didn't see a need to harass him about that because yeah, I think he got the message. Yeah. But most of the guys were that I that I served with over there. I'll tell you, there were some. Uh, a lot of character there. Do you recall any of them by name or any, any Oh, I know a lot of them by name. Uh -huh. Oh, I know. Joe Hogan was a builder out of Chicago. Him and I were very good friends. We used to box one another with towels wrapped around our fist, you know. And uh, who was the other guy? Smitty. Smitty was the guy that I probably owed the most to because he had been in country quite a while when I got there. And uh, I think he could see just how green I was when I got there. So he he more or less took me under his wing and just showed me what I needed to pay attention to, and, you know, and how to keep my head down when I needed to keep it down. And uh, also could drink, man, could Smitty drink. His his favorite drink was Triple CC on the rocks. And I saw this guy put like twelve or fifteen of those, fifteen of those away. Now, you take a guy like myself. When I went, when I first got to Vietnam, I remember the first night I was at Cameron Bay. The guys all said they were going to the EM club. Did I want to tag along? And I told them that I couldn't because I wasn't old enough. I was, I was still only twenty years old. And uh, they looked at me. They started laughing. Said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm not twenty one. He says, "Man, this is Vietnam, you bozo, man. If you if you can get your hands on a bar, they'll serve you. Don't worry about it." Matter of fact, it was duty that you pulled, like guard duty. You know, you could you were the duty bartender, if you will. Okay, so and it was another CB like yourself. So if you told him you want to say you wanted a a double grapefruit and vodka, well, you got a glass full of vodka with a little little splash of grapefruit juice, just enough to give it a little bit of color. Okay, now when I went there, when I went to Vietnam. I'm going to digress a little, a little bit more. The girl that I met before I went to Vietnam, the girl I eventually ended up marrying, okay, first thing she ever said to me, she wanted to know if I was ever sober, which rocked my socks. I might, don't mind telling you. So like anything else I've ever done in my lifetime, I, you know, I, want, I do things to the extreme. There's no moderation. So I quit drinking completely, quit smoking completely, quit swearing completely, okay? And... uh I was the proverbial choir boy when I left here to go to Vietnam, and it was because of her, okay? Because I knew I, she was just somebody special, and I knew I, I was I wanted to spend more time with her. So now, when I came back, <laughs> I could, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I probably couldn't get through two sentences without dropping an f bomb, and I could drink probably a couple of dozen grapefruit and vodkas. Put my flak jacket on, put my steel pot back on, and just walk right back to the hooch like I had never been to the club. Yeah, you know, that's that's you know, she was probably wondering what the hell happened to me in, in the time I was there, you know. But that's the transition. That's what you did. I mean, some guys, I mean, I did a little partying too. I tried a little marijuana too, you know what I mean? But I did I actually didn't do that until I went on my first R and R. But uh it's just a means of escape for a little while. You know, that's all it really is. Did you take your R&Rs? I did two. I did one in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Don't ask me why I chose that place. I could not tell you. Because the first thing I noticed when I got there, all the women there looked so, just like the women in Vietnam. Now, why I would choose to do that, I have no idea. Okay, I, I, I regretted making that choice. Five minutes after I landed there. Now, there was some, Malaysia had something to offer. I mean, there were some beautiful temples there, you know what I mean? There were some caves there, you know what I mean, that you could go in. I mean, there were things to see there, okay? But uh, that was the beginning of the end for me was Kuala Lumpur because that's where I first first started getting into uh, marijuana, some of the, the heavier drugs, too. I remember there was a guy there. His name was Brooklyn. He was with the 101st and... Uh, he asked me the question, and I still remember it. I'll remember it to the day I die. You know, what's 
how much can one joint hurt you? And uh, at the time, I figured one joint couldn't hurt me. But in retrospect, okay, I've been a recovering substance abuser now for 31 years. But at the time, it didn't seem like it was going to be harmful in any way. The reality of it was it sent me on a downhill slide for about the next, well, I didn't get my head out of my ass until 19, the end of 1980. So next 12 years, it was a slippery slope, to say the least. I'd like to meet him again now and tell him, because now I have an answer to that question. I didn't have one then, but I have one now. Uh, Congratulations on your sobriety. Well, thank you. Um, oh, where was your second R&R, &R, as I asked? Australia. Australia. Sydney? Oh, yeah. Now, that was an R&R. &R. That's, that's an R&R &R everybody should get. Yeah. Round-eyed women, cool beer, fosters. Matter of fact, I was lucky in, in, because Australia could be a little expensive, but I was fortunate in that I ran into a guy who had gone there before me and told me there was at the depot to look on the bulletin board at the depot that there were index cards of families that would take you in for three of the five days that you were on R&R. &R. And I, you know, I found the board and I read it and there was one there, as I still remember, Sherry. We have a daughter, Sherry, 21. Give us a call. I said, okay. So I called the number. Just the you know, this, and up drives this nine twelve cocoa brown Porsche, and this girl gets out of it who looks like she should be a a Playboy centerfold. She was just un green eyes, green hazel eyes. Okay, built like it was all all tomorrow. Okay, I'm looking at her and I'm going. I'm saying to myself, Nah, Timmy, that would be dead. No way, pal. You'd be, you don't have that kind of luck, you know? So, next thing I know, she's, she's whips up a sign that has my name on it. Petty Officer Gamak. And I'm going, Timmy, you just died and went to heaven. I can't, I cannot believe this, okay? She gives me a ride home. We go, we meet the parents. Her father is a mechanical contractor. He wanted to know, you know, what I did. And I told him I was a plumber, okay? Now, as soon as I told him I was a plumber, he goes over to his dresser and he's pulling out, believe it or not, contracts. Offering me, you know, he says, when your tour is up, you know, and you get out of the Navy, he says, because they didn't have any skilled help back in Australia back in those days. This is 68 now, okay? So, actually, no, 69. Because they had so little skilled help there. When I showed him, I still had my union card on me. So when I showed him that, you know, that was proof enough for him that I definitely had some had some skills. They were offering me contracts where if I worked for 300, 365 working days, okay, they would pay my way over and back. Now, if I wasn't getting married when I went back to the States, I swear to God, I would have ended up back in Australia. Okay. I would have taken him up on, on that in a heartbeat, okay? But then, when he when we get all done with the little meet and greet, this guy hands me the keys to his 912 Porsche, the keys to his liquor cabinet, and the keys to the house, and tells me that him and the wife to look at us and goes, I guess you two would like to be alone for a little while. We'll see you later. He takes grabs one of the other cars, takes off. I don't see him again for three days. So did they just have an appreciation for American servicemen? Or? You could, your money was no good there. Your money was no good. When you went into a bar, now the Aussie men had a little axe to grind with you because the Aussie women would kind of migrate to the Yankees a little bit, okay? But not to the point where it was, uh, there was a lot of tension. There was no animosity, I would say, because, you know, we, we, I liked Aussie men, okay? These guys... I don't know if I could say this on, on this or not, all right? But they would rather, they'd rather fight than fuck. These guys love to fight, man. 
They go out in the back. They go out in the yard. Man, we roll around for 20 minutes, beat the living snot out of one another. You come back into the bar, they'd buy you a Foster's. They'd say, you're all right, mate. And they'd give you a, buy you a Foster's, okay? Did but, you encounter any Australian troops in country? I not, we didn't work with them. I did encounter them, but we weren't, we didn't work with them at all. Okay. Do you think that's why that they were so appreciative of American servicemen? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Australians and Americans have always had a really good rapport with one another. Okay. And the women were just, <laughs> I have to tell you a little story about Sherry, the mistake she made though, when we went catamaraning in Sydney Harbor. Okay. A catamaran that was made in Waterbury, Connecticut, I might add. That flipped me out. Here I am. I'm halfway around the world, and I'm riding a catamaran that's made in the town, the next town over from where I live. I, what are the chances of that happening, okay? But we're on a catamaran, and we're... Now I'm, I'm toasted, okay? I've been smoking dope, drinking Fosters. I've been having a pretty good time all day. And I said something to the, the skipper of the catamaran that I thought... His boat was slow. So he tells me, well, why don't you get out and swim alongside? I think I will. And I jumped right off the boat into the water. And as soon as I hit the water, the thing's like 50 yards in front of me. I went, it's okay. A little faster than I thought. So I just, I put the hand in the air and he, he tacks around, comes and picks me up. And as I'm climbing back onto the catamaran, this is when Sherry tells me about all the sharks in the bay. I looked at her, I said, Sherry, wrong sequence. You tell me about the sharks before I go in the water, not when I'm climbing back in the boat. You got to tell me about, you should see the rather elaborate system they have at Sydney Harbor to combat shark attacks. They have canoes, power boats, hoses that blow bubbles, netting, Helicopters, all geared to do one thing, all right, to combat shark attacks. There are quite a few in Sydney Harbor, to say the least. But Sydney was, I tell you, that was a lifelong, that's one I'll never forget. I should tell you about the time my wife found the picture of Sherry in my wallet. I don't know what she was doing in my wallet, I have absolutely no idea, okay? But she found the picture, and right in front of me, she took that picture and turned it into confetti right in front of me. Well, I just got up, walked over to the closet, grabbed my coat, grabbed the car keys, walked out the door. Because I said, if I stay here, I'm going to do something I'm going to regret. So I got in my car. I didn't I didn't come back again for like boy, I think four or five days before I came back. And uh, when I, when I walked in the house, I got to give Diane credit, man. She took every one of those pieces, reassembled that picture, laminated it, and framed it. That's because you met her before. I said, that's right. This was long before you and I ever got married. I says, and that picture represents a time a time in my life that, you know, those five days. I got to tell you. Some of the great, I got to sur I got to snorkel and dive the Great Barrier Reef. You know, that's something everybody should do at least once. You know what I mean? But so my military service for all, all the bad of it, there was some good times too. Uh -huh. Were you ever awarded any medals or citations for your service? In Vietnam, I dare say all I got there was the standard campaign and uh, Vietnam service ribbons and a national defense ribbon. Okay. I wasn't uh, what you'd call a 4-0 CB when I was in. I wasn't one of the guys who was getting a lot of awards. I mean, I, I did okay when I was in Vietnam because I was doing what I was trained to do. Right. Okay, In Vietnam, I did all right. I didn't get any uh, awards for valor or anything like that because, like I say, we were a non-combat unit. Okay, We they didn't hand those out in the Navy all that much. Army did because that was their mission, okay? Does the Navy have a combat action ribbon? Well, you know what? You asked that question, and it's funny because it took 20 years. 20? I'm trying to think of when, I, when they finally got around to authorizing what they called a CB combat device that you could wear in your uniform. It's almost like a Marine. I want to... Yeah. Okay. It's it's uh, 
It just denotes that you had boots on the ground and you weren't 30 miles offshore, you know, and they did spend time under fire, okay? Every CB, I can tell you right now, every every CB, no matter where they were, I mean, there's a, there has there was one CB who was awarded the Medal of Honor, okay? The guy's name was Shields, I believe, okay? And every CB, no matter where you were, okay, you came under fire because if you were in a hostile area, you came under fire because you were always in a fixed position, which made you easy to find. You know, you may not have manned a perimeter, but I can guarantee you, you were playing catch with rocket propelled, rocket propelled grenades. You were playing catch with mortars. Okay. And you were probably to some degree playing catch with small arms fire. So did you get an appended DD-214 then? I'm sorry? Uh, would, did you ever get a revised DD-214? With the uh, what's that with, with the combat device? Oh no, no, no! I yeah, you know, I probably that's an excellent question. You know what? I never thought about getting a revised DD two fourteen after they authorized that particular device. I never thought about that. I just you know I I got one because I was authorized to have it and I put it on my uniform, but I never thought about getting my DD two fourteen revised. I think it's too late in the game now. Anyway, I'm six. I'm going to be sixty-five in a month. You know. And uh, I know that's a good question, though. I never thought about that. I noticed that you uh, you didn't list the Purple Heart. Did you sustain any injuries while you were in country? Just got picked up and tossed on my head one time. That was about it. You know, I had, we had a round land close enough to me that it, it picked me off my feet and threw me, but I didn't. Uh, I mean, most of my most of my wounds, I dare say, were psychological, not physical. Did have those, you know, I did have a little PTSD, if you will. You know, I certainly I certainly had to deal with that for a while, but no, I knock on wood, no, no, no real physical wounds. And uh, that actually brings us to the next part of the interview. Uh, how did you stay in touch with your family? While, while I was over there. Yes. Um. <laughs> I got one letter from my father while I was there. That letter was in response to the picture that I told you about earlier, standing on the beach with the shell. Uh, he wanted to know where I really was. He didn't think I was in Vietnam, well, based on the picture he saw. So even though you could see the return address on the envelope and all of that, my father still, I think he gave me more credit for being devious than I really was, but... What I did after that is I sent him a picture of uh, what our base looked like after Tet. And uh, needless to say, he didn't write me back, but I think he got the hint. He knew where I was. And my brother, who never wrote me while I was in Vietnam either, except for, I think I had like, and just to show you, I, I did an extra six months in Vietnam so that I could get a, a cut on my enlistment. And they offered that deal to you. If you did ship for six, then you did three and a half years as opposed to four. So I, I took that deal. I took that because even though Vietnam was, you know, I mean, it was it was life threatening and all that. But at the same time, I was I was learning more. I was I felt like I was doing something, you know, that had some meaning to it more than when I was stateside. Because stateside, all I ever did was. Wash, wax, buff floors, pull guard duty, a lot of Mickey Mouse crap. You know what I mean? It had nothing to do with what I was trained to do. So for your extra six months, is that when you went to Mito? No, I, I, my whole tour was either in Dongtam or Mito. But from time to time, we'd be called upon to leave that area to go. Like I went to as, the farthest north I think I got was Quinyat, which is capital Q U I capital N H O N I'm pretty sure Queen Yan. Yep. Okay. And uh, so and the train. So would you just that like was your typical tour shuttling back and forth between Don Can and Mito? Well when I yes. Okay. Yes. And there's a story to be told about that too. That road is about I want to stay four miles long. Geographically are they close? Very close. Okay. Very close. Four miles away, tops, okay? But every time you had to leave Dongtam to go to Mito, 
okay, in the morning. You, you had to follow the minesweepers, okay? They would, you couldn't just get in your Jeep and drive the, drive the meat, though. You had to follow them over. If, if, you were, if, if you were going there at first light, you had to follow the minesweeper. And what used to flip me out was that out in front of the minesweepers would be local indigenous-type personnel who were working on our base, okay, would be walking out in front of the minesweepers going back to Mito. Now, you'd have to ask yourself why none of these people ever stepped on any one of those booby traps, never stepped on one of those mines. Or why those three generators exploded. Yeah. You do the math, you know what I mean? Made us wonder a little bit. Because they never tripped one. I know that. They never tripped one. And, and a lot of times... Charlie was smart, you know. Charlie was very, very smart. You got, I had to give him that. Okay, what they would do is they wouldn't booby trap the road in the morning. They'd wait until everybody left Dong Tam, got into Mito, then they would booby trap the road because you were ten, you, at the end of a work day. Now you're a little, you're in a hurry to get back, get a shower, whatever. Okay, so you tend to be a little more careless. Okay. This is what, you know, coming back is when they would set them up because that's when you would trip them. And you had to be, you know, this is what you learned to do when you were there, okay? You learned to scope, what we used to call as a drill sergeant, scope and scan. Pay attention to what's going on around you, okay? A Coke can, okay? If that thing wasn't there on your way over to Mito in the morning, but it was there on the way back, and you did not drive over the top of that Coke can. You avoided that thing at all costs. Because you know? that's that's what they would do. It was something as simple as a Coke can. Okay? You never knew. I mean, they were very creative when it came to, you know. But we're lucky, if I may say so. I want, I want to make this point. Vietnam veterans are actually lucky in that the booby traps that we encountered were all random. By that I mean... You had a 50-50 shot of tripping them, okay? Whereas today's booby traps, IEDs, okay, these are not random, okay? They're in a building somewhere waiting for you to drive over the top of this thing with all, all the numbers dialed except one on a cell phone. And when they see your rig over the top of it, they dial the last number. There's no randomness to that, okay? I mean, I don't, I don't know how these guys deal with it. I really don't know. At least, at least we we had to trip them. Did you ever do any kind of uh, explosive ordnance detail or mines? Do detail? no. Okay. Wouldn't want to do that. That's that takes a whole different breed of person to do that. You could have ice water in your veins to do that kind of job, man. I, I don't know that I could do that. So now the rumor about the Navy is that they have the best food. What you, said about, <laughs> what you said about Great Lakes. Who the hell told you that, man? That's what I want to know, man. The Navy has the best food? Submarine wow. I guess that's how you get that's, food on the submarines. That's a fallacy. Food? Let me tell you that right now. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Here's a, here's, here's a story about the food, okay? Here we go. They used to post the menu for the week okay. outside the chow hall. And... This particular week, it was the middle of the week sometime, Tuesday or Wednesday, they posted that they were going to have meatball grinders. Now, you have to understand that in California, this is a point we need me now, okay? They don't even call them grinders. They either call them hoagies or heroes, I believe, in California. They don't call them grinders. Only in, on the East Coast do they really call them grinders, okay? So all the guys that are from the East Coast, man, they see meatball grinders. We're all fired up. Goes, yeah, well, hey, this sounds good, right? Now, I'm watching the guys come out of the chow hall. I'm not seeing a lot of, you know, hey, that was great. Or whatever. I'm not seeing none of that, you know. I'm not saying nothing either. So I get in there, and what they're serving, this is what the Navy thinks is a, is a meatball grinder, okay? It was, and I'm not lying at all, 
a foot-long hot dog roll with six Chef Boyardee meatballs thrown in it with a little bit of grated cheese on top. Now, the guy serving these things, I'm getting ready to say something to him. And he looked at me. He could see I was getting ready to say something. He looked at me and goes, pal, I'm from Brooklyn. You don't have to tell me. I know these are not grinders. Okay. So, okay, pal. All right. As long as you know, I guess we're good, you know. But that's what the Navy thought was a meatball grinder. Yeah. So were there a lot of sea rations? On? When I was in Vietnam, we had sea rations. Yep. Yep. We got a lot. Well, we had a galley. We had a mess hall. Okay. But that usually was for breakfast and your last meal of the day. Your the middle of the day meal, your lunch or whatever, because you would be out in the field was usually sea rations. Do you have a favorite sea ration meal? Oh, yeah, pork slices. Love pork slices. We had a guy with us. He was an American Indian. His name was Jerome King. I still remember him like yesterday. Apparently, he did not like applesauce. Okay. Now, when you get your sea rations, they come to you on pallets. Now, they're usually mixed up. You have B2, B3, B4s, okay? But every now and then, you're going to get a pallet of all B2s, all B3s, or all B4s, okay? Well, we had obviously gotten a pallet where it was all the same, because every day we were getting applesauce with the, I think it was B2, okay? That was the standard dessert with the B2 unit, right? But he doesn't like applesauce, and he's bitching and moaning. He says, man, if I, one more can of applesauce, I don't know, I'm looking at him, so, you know, you're going to keep getting applesauce until that pallet is gone, man. You're not going to figure it out. With you. Well, he opened up his box, and for some reason or other, he was hoping there was going to be something in that BT unit besides applesauce. And when he saw the can of applesauce, he gets this, like, blank look on his face. And I'm looking at him. And I, got, I just, he got to do something really, really whacked. Because I knew him, okay? He takes the can, he walks about 25 feet away, he sets it on a rock, comes back to where we are, and he locks and loads a clip into his weapon and unloads it on the can of applesauce. The whole time, swearing a lot of F-bombs about freaking applesauce. When he gets all done emptying his clip into the can of applesauce, I looked at him and I said, you know what you're getting tomorrow, right? He goes, what? He says, you're getting applesauce, you bozo. I says, what, are you, what are you thinking about? You're going to keep getting it till the P2s are gone, you know? But I don't know. He just he actually really hated applesauce, I guess. Did you have to feel like you uh, had enough supplies while you were overseas? Yeah. In the CBs, I dare say yes. We, we, had no, we had no want for anything. I'd be very honest with you. We, and that, that was not just food, but, uh, you know, is building supplies, things like that, okay? Ammo, plenty of, well, like I said, the only time we had to worry about ammo is when, when Ninth Infantry would come and get us because they were attempting to overrun us, okay? But we did, we were allowed to carry our own weapons, okay? Which uh, a lot of other, when you were at Cameron Bay, that didn't happen. But when you were on detachment and you, if you were in a, you know, a hot area, they would let you carry your own weapons. So your own weapons meaning... M16s, and you had, you had, they, we usually, each one of us would have two bandoliers, which was like, uh, I want to say, six boxes in each bandolier of ammunition, so. But when we, when we had to go out to the perimeter, all we did was just grab our bandoliers, grab our weapons, and hit the bunker, you know. I remember when I was, I was taken out of Dong Tam for, about two weeks, they want. They brought me back to Cameron Bay to be to do time and material, which was to do the takeoff on the Prince for how long something would take, what, what material was necessary to do the job. And I said to myself, "Yeah, I can go back up to Cameron Bay for a couple of weeks and do that, no problem." All right, but when I got up there, I found out all I really was was a uh, glorified coffee boy, going going and making coffee runs for all the officers. Okay, I wasn't even looking at Prince and. Uh, while I was there, they did a, a, a drill, 
on how long it would take them to man their perimeter at Cameron Bay. Now, the first thing they made me do when I got back there was turn my weapon into the armory, something I wasn't all that pleased about, to say the least. So it took, and I'm not exaggerating, because you had to go draw your weapon from the army, go to the ammo point, draw a lot number of ammo from there, and then get out there, and nobody even knew where their, where their foxholes were. They didn't even know. It was like a, it was like a chicken with its head cut off. You know what I'm saying? Nobody knew what the hell they were doing. It took anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes to man that perimeter. And after that exercise was over, I walked up to Chief Waldhuber, who was a, my the person in charge there, and I begged him to send me back to Donktown. And he looked at me like, why would you want to go back down there? I said, because I like my chances down there a lot better. I says, you people ever get hit around here? I says, I grant you, it never did get hit. Now, Cameron Bay was, uh, it was probably the, the safest place in Vietnam. Wasn't too many safe places, but that was one of them, okay? But I told him, as you guys ever do get hit here, there's not one of you going to survive. You think Charlie's going to hold off for 20 minutes and let you actually man the perimeter first before they attack? Are you crazy or what? I said, give me my weapon, give me my two bandoliers, put me on a boat, and send me back. You know? So. So, do you feel any pressure or stress while you're in country? By your job? How were you expected to feel? Not. No. I want to I want to say no. Uh, be. Because like I say, you know, I keep saying it, that was the one time I was in the Navy where I got to do what I was trained to do, okay? I got to work with some really incredible guys who, I mean, who could drive heavy equipment in ways that, you know, do things with it that I had never seen anybody else do. You know what I mean? It was the learning experience for me is what I think over overrode any stress or whatever else I had there because I was learning how to do things that I never would have learned how to do either stateside or if I had stayed home as a plumbing apprentice. I mean, I learned how to, like, like I said, I learned how to drive not only a standard, but because our equipment operator de out and we didn't have an operator to replace them for like three months, okay, for that three-month time frame, I got a crash course on how to drive everything in that motor pool. I learned how to drive the motor pool. I mean the uh, the bulldozers, the earth movers, the graders, the cherry pickers, the forklifts. I did all of that. The only one I sucked at was the grader. That, that was a little tough. That one, grader has a blade that sits right below you that moves like this. It's like forty-five. It moves like this. It moves like this, and it moves like this and this. Too many moving parts for me, man. I, I didn't. I didn't quite master that one. <laughs> But I learned how to weld. I should tell you my how I learned how to gas weld. I uh, so I was still at Cameron Bay, as a matter of fact. No, I was I was back at Cameron Bay for Thanksgiving and Christmas. They brought us back. Come on, you know how to drive that forklift? Now this is before I actually learned how to drive it, but I'm too proud to tell the guy that I don't know how to do it. So I, oh yeah, absolutely, I know how to drive it. He goes, good, take that pallet, put it against that cloncher that right there. No problem. You know, I mean, I, driving heavy equipment, a lot of it is, you know, they got the, got the things on the dashboard that tell you what everything is, okay? A lot of it is just plain common sense, okay? So I pick up the pallet, but this is a big forklift now. It has big blades on it. I didn't, forgot about the fact that the blades were sticking through the other side of the pallet, Probably a good 30 inches, okay? And I drove her right up this side of that pallet, put that baby right up against the and put two beautiful little holes right in the side of that Quonset hut. Nice little square holes from where I, okay? As I, when I backed out, I didn't even know when I first put it in. I didn't realize what I had done until I started pulling back out because I could hear the metal scraping against the blades. I'm going, oh my God, okay. Now, who, just the kind of luck I have, Whose air conditioning you think is being lost with the two holes I just created in the side of the Quatsa Hut? Chief. Chief So my next lesson was in gas welding. 
how to patch the two holes. Okay, what? Mother is the, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. It's also the mother of intelligence, too. You know? it'll, it'll make you learn how to learn one way or the other. Speaking of these situations, uh, did you ever do anything special for good luck while you were in country? I don't know that I ever didn't carry any, any kind of good luck charm or anything like that. But I will say that you... You look for little signs, okay, that you know you might you might make it out of this place, okay. I I can give you an example of that too. In my uh, cubicle when I was in Dongtan, I had whole I had to have two dozen pictures of Diane, the girl I eventually married. I had her pictures hanging everywhere on my wall locker, on the wall. I even had a framed picture of her where I had a light shining on 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 the, her picture. Right above my bed every night. Okay, just what you do to you know, do what you got to do, right? <laughs> um, a mortar round hit right at the corner, outside the hooch, of the wall, right at the base of the wall. Okay, right outside of my room. I come inside. I have burn marks coming up through my my bed. Burn marks in the walls. Holes in the wall locker. I mean, the first thing I'm saying to myself, well, I'm really glad I wasn't in that bed because, you know, my name would be on a wall somewhere. But I'm also looking, right? There was not one hole or tear in any one of Diane's pictures. Not one. Okay? Now, I know it sounds absolutely insane, okay? But you see something like that. I'm looking at that. I'm taking that as... A sign, you know that you know you're gonna get you're gonna get a chance to see her again. Well, I know that sounds really crazy, but it's it's true, you know. And here's how, and here's another little escape from reality. Diane used to send me three inch reel to reel tapes, and what I would do when one of those came, I'd take out one of her uh, old letters. She would, I, at my request, so every now and then she would soak one of the letters in charisma. It was a perfume she wore that I absolutely just drove me crazy, okay? I would take out one of the old letters that was soaked in charisma. I'd lay in my bunk. I'd lay the letter over my face so I could smell the perfume. And I hit the button and I hit the play button so I could hear her voice and smell her perfume at the same time. So for however long that tape played, it's like I wasn't even in Nam anymore. I was back home with her. <laughs> hey, you do what you got to do, baby. Did you ever see any entertainers while you were in country? <laughs> I was supposed to see, supposed to see, Raquel Welch at the Bob Hope Show at Cameron Bay. Now, they sent the bus down there, but me and a couple other guys, we thought we would get smart, and we would commandeer a Jeep and beat them all there. Well, the bus left, and we hadn't left yet. Well, between the time the bus left and w the time when we could commandeer that jeep, the commanding officer decides he's going to call a yellow alert, which required everybody to man the perimeter. So the guys on the bus, they got to see the show. The guys, me and my two buddies, we got to stare at the wire all night long instead of going to the show. Now, one of the guys that went to the show he comes back, tells the guys he's got slides of the show. He's charging everybody $1 to come and see the slides. It's a buck. So we go into this hooch. He's got the white sheet hanging on a wall, right? Everything's all set up. He starts to show the slideshow. There's this little thing about this big in the middle of the sheet. Raquel Welch is like about three quarters of an inch high. When we look at the guy, he's, can you, uh, you know... Blow that up a little. He goes, oh, no. He says, that's it, man. This guy had to be like 600 rows back or something. I don't know where he was sitting. But I looked at him. I said, I could do better than that with a Playboy magazine. Give me my buck back. He had, everybody had to, he had to pay everybody back the, the dollar he gave. And he better pay him back, too, I'll tell you. Because if he said no, he wasn't going to get out of that hooch. But the answer to your question, no, I didn't get to see any entertainers. 
I suppose at this point we should pause the interview and uh, set up for part two.